Well, welcome. My name is John Swearingen, Jr., and I am the director of the Museum of Fulton County. And today is Coffee with the Curator, and we're going to show you some parts and pieces of the special exhibit in our uh, Worthington Gallery. And you can see behind me some artifacts from the Howard family. It was one of the big families in the town of Winnemag, which is near the middle of the county. And there's not much of it left today, um, but there's some very important stories to tell. So when you come to see the exhibit, we're open all the way through the end of 2021 for this exhibit. Uh, it is here 10 to 4, Monday through Saturday, and noon to 4 on Sunday. And it goes from the prehistoric period all the way to the 1980s with the um, closing of the Winnemag 8th grade school. So I'm today going to show you some artifacts that are not in the exhibit and some of them are from the research room, the space research room, and you're welcome to come anytime and look through these artifacts, do your own research on Colonel Howard and the Howard family. Um, we're very happy that this last few years we received generous donations from the family. Um, Lawrence McLaren passed away and his brother, cousin Robert passed away and their families donated everything you're going to see in the exhibit. Um, his life span was very long from the early time period right after the War of 1812 all the way into the 1890s almost to the Spanish-American War. So there's quite a few stories in his past, and our um, librarian likes to nickname him the Forrest Gump of Fulton County because if you can think of it, he did it, and he was there. So um, I'll start in his early childhood. He was from New York State, born in 1817. And when the family came here, um, they lived in the Grand Rapids area, and there still is a Howard Cemetery in Grand Rapids. If you uh, ever go through that town, you can see the where they're all buried. And um, during that time period, uh, there wasn't very many schools, and he was sent to an Indian uh, missionary school run by the Presbyterians in an island, in an Indian island, in, they call it, in the middle of the Maumee River near Grand Rapids. And this book, it was printed in 1814, so it would have been just a few years before he was born, and it's his English book. And it has his name inside of it, and so it's pretty cool to think of um, something this old being in the collection and uh, that this family has saved it from all those years. So this is around 1823. He would have received this book for his um, lessons. You know, it wouldn't have been the brand new book at that time period, because the missionaries would take whatever they could find to help teach um, out here in the wilderness, because this is a pretty rough area in 1823. Then when he moves on uh, as a young boy, in 1830s, his father starts a trading post out here in Fulton County, he builds a log trading post, and during the fall and winter seasons, he stocks this with merchandise to trade with the Native Americans for furs. And then these furs are taken to Detroit and sold to the big fur companies. So during this time period and at the school, Colonel Howard learned how to speak all the different dialects of the Algonquin uh, speaking f natives in this area. So he would have learned to speak with the Adawas, the Potawatomi, the Miami, the Shawnee, all of those different variations. So when we got into the, he was a 12-year-old boy, he was asked to be at a treaty, which was held at the Council Elm Tree in Grand Rapids, and um, it was called Wolf Rapids back then, and he was asked to be the interpreter because they wanted to make sure that everything was properly trans, transcribed or trans, um, translated to the Native Americans and that they could understand what was going on. Um, as he got older then, he became a trader himself. In the 1840s, as a young man, he joined uh, the forces of the Ewing Brothers Trading Company. And the Ewing Brothers went all over the United States, and this took him all the way out west, and some really 
horrendous trips and the scary things happened and all that's in these stories that you're going to come and read. Um, but this saddle behind us was up in the attic in the Winnemag home and it's Colonel Howard's saddle from that time period. I did research on the style and the shape with the really high um, horn and the really high rear end piece um, is typical of the Spanish style. So this would have been something he purchased when he was out west, probably in New Mexico, what we now call New Mexico, and brought this home with him from his trip. He probably rode it home um, during the 1840s. Then in 1842, his father passed away back here in Grand Rapids, and now all the weight of the world was on his shoulders to take care of the property and the trading post in Grand Rapids, and it's time to settle down. So this is when he met Mary, this Mary Blackwell Copeland, and she was uh, also from the same area of New York, and her family was uh, settling in the same area of Ohio. And right here in front of us, we just received this from an auction recently, and this is their wedding silver set um, that they would have received probably by her parents or at her parents' home in Monroe, Michigan. And so it's a lot fancier than most things that people would have out here in the wilderness in 1842. So this is a real prized um, collection item to us. So then in 1843, the state of Ohio asked him to help with a turnpike that they were building along the Maumee River between F Fort Wayne and um, Fort Wayne and Toledo. And so this little book is his log book that he kept track of everything that was going on during the construction time period of the uh, turnpike. And then what's funny about this is when he finished the job, he didn't finish the book. And so his granddaughter, Mary, also named Mary, used the book for her diary. <laughs> so we have a whole 1910 diary in the back of this book. So she, she uh, used the book wisely because it had extra pages in it. And we have found out several things like that in the collection where the, where the families use something twice. Um, and then the 1850s, we're getting closer to the Civil War, but he first goes out west to Kansas and meets the Native Americans that he had helped take out there in 1830s. So that was part of his job and why the government became, made him a colonel, was so that he could um, be an official interpreter and help the Native Americans relocate from uh, Fulton County out west. And so during that time period in the 1840s, he went out to visit them and received gifts from them. There are several things here that are examples of that and in our permanent exhibit, gifts that were given to him during this time period. And his first Maple Row home, which is recreated here behind you, looked like this photograph right here. It was a Greek Revival temple style building very popular in the Western Reserve, Connecticut Reserve, which is over by the Cleveland area. And um, the big pillars makes you think of Gone with the Wind. And, and uh, the house was rebuilt in 1914 with the same porch. They just reconfigured it on the new home. Uh, and that is where the family moved to. Uh, and then we had the California Gold Rush. And of course, he's gonna be part of the California Gold Rush. His wife poo-poos that, though, and instead he goes out to uh, Harper's Ferry area and starts his own town just out of the blue, buys up land and puts it lots together and forms a little town named Harper's Ferry. So this is not the Harper's Ferry that we think of with the uh, Civil War, but in uh, out west, the other direction. Uh, then he became a delegate for the Republican Convention in Chicago. Now you remember the Republican Party didn't start until 1856 so John Fremont was the first person ever to run as a Republican for president and in 1860 um, Colonel Howard would have been there and helped elect Lincoln as a Republican because he was a Republican and 
So that's a pretty cool story. And he was also at the second convention when Lincoln was uh, nominated the second time uh, for president. His daughter Mary Agnes was born during the Civil War and a lot of money was made during the Civil War by Colonel Howard because of his sheep. He had a huge quantity of sheep. He uh, would sell the older animals that couldn't be used anymore for breeding and sold those to the government for mutton for serving the soldiers and then he sold the wool to the government to use to make the wool coats and uniforms that the men wore. So he became quite so wealthy after the Civil War that he had money in, after the war in 1865 to build a second home out of bricks in town in Wauseon and when they, they called that Howard Hill. And it's quite a bit of land. It ran from um, it ran from Prospect Street all the way to Shoup Avenue, if you know where that is in Wauseon. That was that was his winter home. So they lived there during the winter and out in the Winnemeg during the summer months. And then he became part of the State Board of Tax in 1870, and he writes extensively about the Maumee Valley and gets, starts getting interested in the history as he sees it disappearing. He sees the trees being all cut down, the farms being built, and all the stories, stories of the early pioneers and the Native Americans are disappearing. So that's when he starts forming our organization and the Maumee Valley Historical Society. He leads, uh, then the, leads the construction of the uh, railroad that ran between Grand Rapids and Toledo. If you have ever been on the Bluebird Special, which is the railroad train, um, excursion train in Grand Rapids, that's the tracks I'm talking about that ran uh, downtown Toledo from Grand Rapids. And that was very successful also. Uh, then he was elected to the state senate in 1872, and we have his clipboard from when he was sat in his in the state house in Columbus for his meetings. Um, then, then his wife and daughter in 1876 went to the big centennial. So we remember the 1976 cent bicentennial, but they were experiencing the 1876 centennial, and they got to go to Philadelphia and see that and. Um, talked about a lot of things that happened during that time period and books and artifacts that they brought from that. Um, then he was appointed part of the Toledo Insane Asylum um, in, by the governor of Ohio for Toledo and that stood for quite a while. Uh, it was, I think it torn down in the 90s. Um, authorized the exploration of Indian mounds on his property and I don't want to get into that too much because we actually have artifacts here that you can see examples of the mounds. And uh, in the 1890s then, at the end of his life, he found out that he had cancer. And how he told his family was in 18, 1896 at Christmas, when they were all sitting at the table, he told them all that he was dying of cancer. And so this then led to quickly, as fast as he could, to keep track of his whole life story. And that is when he started writing his memoirs. So this huge quantity, I have boxes and boxes of his stories of his life that he tried to write down as fast as he could before he passed away um, on everything that happened to him and the stories that the old people had told him back in the, in the, night, in the 1820s. So there's stories about um, people that lived through the War of 1812, stories about even um, before that, back in the um, early writings. So that's really interesting, and we're hoping to make a book um, of his writings um, as soon as we can. We're, we've, we're in the process right now of editing, and that's a long process to make it so that you can read it. Um, sometimes his grammar wasn't the greatest, and uh, we want to try to make it more historically historically accurate and readable. Um, so that, as you can see, that he was quite an interesting man and quite a life story. His wife's name was Mary, then they had a daughter named Mary, and then they had a granddaughter named Mary. 
So it's very confusing. This happened with Lincoln, too. His wife was Mary, his um, daughter-in-law was Mary, and then her daughter was Mary. And so it's really hard when you're doing research to know which Mary you're talking about. So when you come in, just give me a call and I'll help you out and I'll help you decipher through all this great um, Howard history. And if any of you out there are Howards from the Howard family, this is the Howard family tree behind me and I wanted people that live in Fulton County to make the connection of how they might know a neighbor who's related to this family tree. So we don't have a lot of things from the um, the opposite side of the tree in our collection. So we're still looking for more artifacts from that part of the Howard family. So keep us in mind um, if you know anybody or you yourself are from the Howard family. So thank you. That's a little long today f for a coffee with the curator, but I really appreciate you listening and learning and hope that you will come and explore this great special exhibit. Thank you.